So next, um, we're going to invite uh, Melanie, all right, and she's the expert on sample prep. So please listen carefully. Without a good sample prep, it's going to be total garbage when you analyze. Um, so without wasting any time, Melanie, you can come over. Thank you. Hello oh, everyone, good morning. Well, now afternoon, pushing there at least. I think everyone's still okay and awake. <laughs> um, probably a little hungry. Um, my name is Melanie Peralta. I don't know if my, most of you might know me from a pathology research program, which is located at UHN. I am unfortunately no longer there. I am now with Mount Sinai, sorry. Um, but the lab is still there and they're well set up to help you guys with your Zoom. So that's what we're going to talk about is histology, preparation for Xenia. So during this lecture, you should be able to understand the histological process to produce a paraffin block or frozen block. I will touch on the frozen very briefly. It's not normally used um, in the Xenia platform, but it is available. Um, I don't know how often it's used, but I know it's not as often as the paraffin. Um, as well, you'll be able to describe how a tissue section is mounted for Xenium analysis. So you'll see how that's actually mounted onto the slide. And you'll know the process for producing a quality slide ready for Xenium processing. And I'm going to emphasize on quality because the quality part of it is actually very hard to determine until your finished product. Sometimes you can't tell prior to, but if you have someone who's actually cutting it well, you should be able, that person should be able to tell you if the section was cutting well or not. Um, so I'm going to emphasize on that um, when we look at the actual slides. So there's only three important steps, actually, that are very important when you're doing um, tissue prep. Number one, which is the main one, fixation. Number two is tissue processing, which is basically taking the tissue through this machine that will actually extract water out and infiltrate the tissue back with wax. And then the embedding process, which is basically the producing that block that you guys see beautiful pictures of and that we cut on a microtome, um, which you'll actually get to see a little bit on, on a video. So hopefully it works. I don't have technical difficulties either. <laughs> um, so we're going to look at those big three um, processes. First one, fixation. So fixation is to preserve the tissue in a lifelike manner and protect the tissue during tissue processing. So what you basically wanna do, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, when you guys are fixing, you're gonna be using a fixative. That fixative is actually gonna interact with the proteins in the tissue and produce what they call cross-linking. So basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna have this little chemical reaction between the proteins and start cross-linking in the tissue. Once it starts cross-linking, you actually produce this, if you wanna call it, cage around that tissue and it'll freeze every single thing at that moment, at that point in time, as it is when it came out of the animal, body, organ, whichever piece you're working with. So that's what you're trying to do. And if you produce that cage properly, the subsequent steps later will protect this tissue and give you beautiful images. Um, if you don't do that, uh, you're going to get not so great images when you start doing your xenium and then you're, it's not going to look that great. So we really want to emphasize this fixation. So there's two universal fixatives that's on, that are used. One is the 10% neutral buffered formalin. This is clinically and diagnostically used widely um, as well in all hospitals. And as, of course, I'm sure you've used it in your experiments. The other one is 4% formal, paraformaldehyde which is the powder form. It's the same thing. It's just that one is concentrated power form. The other one is a liquid that they dilute down to 10%. Exactly works exactly the same thing. Most people will probably use the commercial because it's ready to use and it's easy to work with. And it's already buffered so you don't have to worry about it decomposing or precipitating out of your tissue. So here we go. Factors to consider during fixation. Now, a lot of you, I'm not sure if you're going to be working with human tissues. Maybe most of you are going to be working with cell lines, um, maybe xenografts, mouse tissue, or rat tissue, or organs up from those 
those animals and species I've mentioned. What you really want to make sure is that the size of the tissue fits into the cassette. So if you look just above at the top, the little pink plastic container there, that's called a cassette. So you want your tissue to actually fit into that cassette. You don't want it to be any thicker than 0.5 centimeters. So five millimeters, if you want to be exact, you want this to be in uh, 0.5, five millimeters, uh, sorry, 0.5, yeah, into the cassette. And you don't really want it to be squished in that it's touching the edges. You want it to be free, kind of free in there. So this is actually a picture of brain, which has already been fixed with formalin. And before we put it into the cassette, we actually bisected it um, sagittally into two halves. And we also included the spinal cord. So this is mouse. So now when you're considering the tissue for fixation, not only is size important, but your density, the density of the tissue and the tissue type. So if you're working with brain fat or mammary, these are very high lipid types of tissues. You don't want these to be under fixed. You want these to be slight, like you want it to be fixed, even a slightly over fixed if you want. And what I mean by slight, I'm not talking about leave it there for three months. I'm talking about if you're going to do 24 hours for a brain, I would do it extended out to about 72 hours for a brain. If you're using mammary, which is um, usually a very fatty tissue, not as dense, but it's fatty, you're going to leave that maybe for even extended period, three to five days. So five days, you can even leave it up to seven. The key here is the volume. So when you go to the next point, you're talking about the volume of fixative. It needs to be one in 20. So 20 times the volume of your tissue. So you don't want to be using this little tiny tissue and you're only going to put five ml of formalin in there. It may work for a biopsy, but it's not going to work if you have a brain or a spinal cord. You need a little bit more than that. So it's usually better to be more than less. And then at that same point, you need to change your formalin if you're going to leave your tissue in for three days at least once. So you need to change it. You can't just leave it. Reason why, like I said in the beginning, fixation is crossing, you're, you're producing cross linkages. You use that up as you go through the tissue. So the thicker your tissue is, the more of that you're going to produce and you're going to use up your formula. So you need to refresh it. Okay. So the next part is temperature. Now, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard, keep it in the fridge. You can do that. It's actually best at room temperature. All tissues that go through diagnostically are actually kept at room temperature and fixed at room temperature. The key again, like I said, volume and changing that formalin all the time. So they'll change it every other day or every two days, three days, depending on the tissue and the size. And then on top of that, how, many, how, how much hours are you going to spend? Well, 24 hours is the minimum for tissue. But like I said, depending on the type of tissue that you're working with, it can go anywhere from two to five days, sometimes even 10 days. Because maybe you're working on a Friday, you want to fix it, but you can't come in on the weekend. That's okay. You can leave it in the formalin on Monday, change it out, and then you can bring it up to the lab and just let them know when you started your fixation. Because then they'll determine whether to leave it in formalin or whether they can process it and go ahead with it. So now we're going to talk about tissue processing. So after it's fixed, you've produced this wonderful little cage around your tissue. You're protecting it now. It needs to go through tissue processing. Tissue processing is actually a process in which you're taking the tissue, which is water-based or wet fixed, and you're going to go take it through graded alcohols. And it usually go, goes up in gradient. And you're going to use that alcohol to extract the water out of the tissue. Now, why would you want to extract the, tissue, the water? Thing is, you need to embed it with wax. And wax and water, not miscible. So you need something to be able to put that wax in there. So what you're going to use in between the wet fix tissue and your wax is what they call xylene. And xylene is another solvent that actually will go into the tissue after you've gone through your gradients of alcohol, so increasing gradient of alcohol, Xylene comes in and pushes that alcohol out. And once that alcohol is out, now xylene is miscible with wax. And now that wax is going to come into the tissue and give that tissue structure so you can cut it. 
So it's actually going to harden a little bit. It's going to be hard and a little bit pliable on at the same time. So this is an automatic processor. I know it looks kind of weird. It's actually quite ancient. This one's probably older than I am, believe it or not. A lot of histological work is still manual. So I understand the difficulties in technology because I'm probably the least of working with technology. So basically, it's like a, think of it like a dishwasher or a washing machine. You're going to open up the top. You're going to load in your tissue. You're going to lock it in place and you're going to press a button and walk away. That's exactly what it is. Everyone's like, what? But why does it take long? Wow. Well, this is actually how long it will take. Because you're going through wet fixed tissue into alcohol, into xylene, and end up with the infiltrated wax, you're looking at a routine standard time of 14 to 18 hours going in and out of fluids. That's why it takes so long. I know everyone says, oh, but you can produce it. Yeah, not really. You have 24 hours of fixation, and then you need at least an overnight process in order to process your tissue. So in a nutshell, if you want to remember what processing is, you remember the word wax. W, sorry, I already told you this, it'll get hard. So W, wet fixed tissue. Alcohol, graded alcohols. Xylene, the next step. What do you end up? Wax. So you have a wax infiltrated block. Something easy to remember, just in case you're ever thinking about the process. So from here, we're now going to move into blocking, or what they call embedding. So here's the embedding process. As you can see in the picture on the far left, this is a tech actually working with that same cassette that you saw previously with the braid, and she's embedding it into a metal mold. It's like jello. So basically what you want to make sure is Whatever you want to see is face down into that metal mold. So the surface that you want to cut is face down into it. And then if you see at the very, very far, it's probably a little hard to see, um, um, probably just away from her hands, there's these little yellow tissues just at her fingertips. Those are actually the spinal cords cut into cross sections, which she will then embed cross sectionally alongside with the brain. So these are all done at this step. And then, so what they're using there, that clear fluid that you're seeing, that's still wax. So you're making the wax block. Then it's gonna go onto a cooling machine that's gonna probably cool it down to about eight, four to eight degrees, if not cooler. And it'll freeze that, not freeze it, but solidify that wax until it gets hard. And then you pop it out. You pop it out of the mold like jello, and then you have your tissue right in front of you ready to cut. That's how that's made. If everyone, anyone wanted to know, that's how it's made. So this is the video um, of mounting, because I don't know if a lot of you know what that looks like. Um, it's actually not as easy as people think. For us, it's a little easy because we've been trained in it. But at the same time, I mean, it's not something most people will see. So this is just a video from CellPath. So this is not from an actual lab that I actually work in, but it was just a nice video to show what actually happens. Pick their cell, but that's okay.
So that was basically in a nutshell, cutting your section that I told you that you just embedded and then floating it out in a water bath. That's called the water bath. And basically that's what happens when we're gonna actually mount your tissue onto Xenium. Keep that in mind. The slide that we showed here is just a normal slide. That's what we normally do in histology. That's what we normally do on a daily basis. As you can see, it was quite easy to do. But now picture this when you're doing your Xenium a little later, I'll show you. So here's your Xenium. As you guys know from uh, Farzaneh's uh, talk earlier, the Xenium area of interest is basically the way I look at it, to simplify it for myself, is one by two centimeters. That's your area. It's not very big if you try to measure this out on a slide. Now, the thing is with the Xenium, um, you can't touch the sides. You can't touch the, the actual slide itself in that area because if you touch it, it's done. Can't use it. Um, so you need to make sure you avoid that at all times. So, of course, for this, you're going to treat it like RNA and DNA work. So you're basically going to be using MilliQ type of water or RNA-free water. All your instruments have to be RNA, DNA-free rinsed or cleaned. And then, of course, we're all masked up. So we'll make wear a mask, we'll tie our hair up, we're wearing lab coats, we're wearing gloves. And before we even touch the specimen, we're actually going to clean our hands with RNAs away before we actually touch the specimen. Because this, when you work with this tissue, you wanna make sure that it's as clean as possible so that your sequences don't have all these other junk that you don't wanna pick up. Now, one, things you have, one thing you have to remember with the Xenium slide, unlike any other platform for Visium or Visium cytosis, which is all room temperature, the slides are kept at minus 20. So once they come out of minus 20 and come to room temperature, you really only have about seven days to use it. So make sure you have your plan of attack when you're gonna mount your tissues and what tissues you're going to use. And of course, when you're running the Xenium platform, you can only run two slides at a time. You can't run more than that. So you wanna keep that in mind as well when you're choosing the blocks that you're actually gonna use for Xenium. And I do understand that this is a very expensive platform. So I'm sure that will actually play into what you're gonna actually use as well. So this is, what you need to keep in mind. So now we get some concerns sometimes when we're cutting. Now, how do you know your tissue is actually gonna be good to be able to cut and mount onto a slide? So there's a few factors. One, the tissue processing and the tissue fixation is extremely key. So if you look at the top picture, that's actually tissue not processed well. Now, two factors there, it could be the tissue processing, meaning, the tissue processing was actually too short. It's not long enough. So it's not well infiltrated with wax or the water wasn't extracted out well enough or fixation caused this and there's nothing we can do. Once it's gone through to this point, we, I can't go back. There's no going back. So you have one shot and making sure your tissues are fixed and processed well, one shot. So the top one, as you can see, it looks like it's spreading apart. So the water bath is usually, for Xenium, we keep anywhere between 40 to 42 degree, degrees centigrade. That's how warm that water bath is in order for the section to get flat. Now, if this is exploding at that temperature, that tells me right off the bat that the tissue is no good. So all your RNA or whatever DNA you're going to be looking for in that tissue is not going to be good quality. So you might need to replace that with another block. And normally, the tech that's cutting it should be able to tell you that and say, can't use it, it's exploding, can't even get it onto, you can't even mount that. But by the time you mount it, it's all over your fiduciary area, slide is done. So you gotta make sure that your tissues are well fixed and well processed. The second picture, now, those are actually fixed well, very nice, cut beautifully. But the problem there is they're big. So those tissues are bigger than that one by two centimeter area. And to mount that into your Xenium, you have to do one of two things. You're either gonna cut that tissue down to size to fit one by two, or you can remove the wax and you can just fit just the tissue right in there. And there is a way to do that, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then the bottom one, this is a picture of overcrowding. So this was the last Xenium I did for a client out west. And they told me that I could not make a TMA out of their block. I could not do anything except mount 
the actual original tissues onto the slide. I'll show you again what how I did this, but there's actually a total, I think, of two tissues on one slide, and the other one has six, all done from the original wax block without pouring it or taking it out or doing anything to it. And it's very difficult to do. It took me two hours to do two slides, which normally one slide when you mount it, less than five minutes, you're done. So you're gonna see this in the next slide. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back into mounting again. Like I said, it's extremely important to be able to fit this, the sections onto that Xenium slide without overcrowding and reiterating again. You don't want any overlapping and ensuring the best quality possible. And like I said, um, actually it's, like, it's mentioned in the 10X genomics. You wanna make sure you can fit three sections. I'm sure you've seen those pictures over and over again on the slide, you see three brains in a row. That's basically what you wanna be able to fit onto that area. But some people like in the previous slide fit six. And it, that takes a very highly skilled technical person in order to be able to do that. And I'm talking about the histologist in the uh, pathology department that can do that for you. Um, the other way, which most people don't talk about, is you can actually create a TMA. Now, I, I'm gonna caution you with the TMA. You don't want your sections, to, you don't want your TMA, your cores that you take for your TMA to be one millimeter, because that's not gonna give you much info. You need them to be at least two millimeters to four millimeters in diameter. Has anyone seen what a DMA, TMA looks like? Hmm, it looks like a domino. Do you know what a domino looks like? Yeah, picture a domino and picture six dots. That's basically what you want to fit into your Xenium, just a little closer together and no more than four millimeters in diameter. That's basically what it looks like. And you can put multiple tissues into that little domino. That's what it looks like. So you can fit uh, pancreas, you can put liver, you can put whatever you like into that little thing and stain it all on one shot. But that costs money, of course, when you do a TMA. And it, it has a little bit more time because you have to choose the area circle the area to, to actually punch it out and put it into that little domino that I'm describing. So I should have put one of those next time I remember. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on. So this is that six tissue that I put on. Oh, sorry. Um, basically, oh, it's okay. If you look above, um, so the very first picture, that you see on either side, you see two slides overlap each, on each other. So one slide has an H&E, that's actually um, colon cancer, that's on that picture. And then you see a picture, another slide right on top of it. That slide on top of it, that's actually a template of the Xenium slide. So I drew it out because they wanna be able to fit. You see that nice, lovely roller coaster size tissue that's kind of outlined, they want that in the actual tissue. But I can't take it out. I can't take it out of the block. So what I actually have to do is score it out. And I will show you guys that in the next slides. So what I like to do is I like to take my Xenium slide, my little fake Xenium slide, apply them to each tissue to see how much I can actually fit and map onto that slide. The next slides in the middle, where you see the circles, those are all the tissues that they want specifically on the slide. All the other slide tissues that you see that are not circle, they don't want them. So how do I get that all into a slide? It's quite difficult actually when you start scoring it. And then of course, on the very far end, you see the block. So what I do is I match up the H and E to the block and I circle that area that I need. So once I circle that area, it has to match up exactly, because if it doesn't, then I have to go back to the pathologist or the researcher and say, look, it doesn't match. I don't think this is the correct block that goes with the slide. Then we have to go back from square one, pick another block, pick another slide, and make sure we circle the area that's a, that they need. So basically, that's what I have to go through in order for me to do multiple tissues on one slide. So this is what they do scoring. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a grid pattern on one of the blocks. So on that grid pattern, whatever area they circled, 
that's the only piece I'm going to take and mount onto the onto that slide. And what happens is when you're doing this grid grid pattern, so you remember the water bath. Once I float that out, this whole entire tissue is going to fragment into multiple pieces. I'm only going to pick one out of those multiple pieces, and I have to fish it out. Basically, that's exactly what you're doing. Fishing it out of that water bath. So it can get very, very difficult. Hence why I, I will emphasize, just try to pick three sections to fit on your slide. Because the chances of that fiduciary area getting covered is extremely high. And if the tech that's working on it is not very well versed yet at cutting, um, it might take a little bit of practice. So it's best to practice before you actually mount it on the Xenium. Because the Xenium slides are expensive. How many serial sections does this flooring have? How many serial sections? Um, depending on how deep you score. So I usually will only score from a half a millimeter to a millimeter in. Um, so then maybe after 20 sections, maybe you'll be past the scoring already and it'll go back to the way it was. And that's usually what diagnostic um, labs want you to do because they don't want you to destroy the archive material so this is what i have to do i have no choice um when we're, when they want xenium on it and of course the sections for xenium is five microns you can do four if you really have to but recommended is of course five five micro, uh, five micron stick so now the picture beside it that's all the tissues that i showed you in the other slide mounted onto the actual Xenium slides without touching the fiduciary sides. And you can see one of them has a long piece in it. That's that long piece that you saw at the beginning that was overlapped. That's there. So this was a feat on its own. Um, I don't know what the success rate was on this. Um, maybe Farzani can tell you later, but she was actually the one that did the work on it after fact, and she said it worked okay. So I don't know. And I have no idea what happened to the data. So I don't know either. <laughs> Hopefully it was all good because they didn't come back. So, or maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But um, like I said, the sectioning for Xenium is quite um, difficult. It's not as easy as, uh, as it looks. And it looks nice because it's already on a slide for you ready to go to, to Farzane. Um, But if you're not using Farzane, I mean, it's the same thing. It, it's not that easy to do. So I'm gonna move on now to the frozen. Is there any questions on the paraffin part of it? Okay. So we're gonna move into frozen. This part I don't do very often. It's actually the same process. What's actually important here, so the cutting and the, the thickness is what's different. The thickness is 10 microns for the frozen. So versus the paraffin is four microns. It's 10 microns for frozen, four micro five microns for the paraffin. So in the frozen, what's important there is how you're gonna freeze it. So there's different ways of freezing tissue in OCT or not using OCT, I recommend OCT. And so does 10X Genomics. Actually, I think one of these pictures is from 10X Genomics, if not both. Um, you don't, you want to make sure you use liquid nitrogen with an isopentane. So you're going to use liquid nitrogen as your bath and isopentane inside. Another beaker inside that actual liquid nitrogen and freeze your, your um, not freeze, but cool down your isopentane to about minus 80 minus 90. Or if you if you don't have a thermometer, quick quick kind of um, rule of thumb, when the isopentane gets syrupy. So when it gets syrupy, you're ready to freeze. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to take your mold. You, you've seen plastic molds before for freezing? No? It's, it's basically, it's like it's plastic and it looks like a little block, except it's plastic. And you're going to put this gel inside that's clear and you're gonna put your tissue there, make sure it's flat to the bottom because the bottom piece is gonna be your front cutting surface. And you're gonna freeze it down into your isopentane, which takes only about 30 seconds, 30 seconds to a minute, depending on the thickness of your tissue and the size of your tissue. And then you're gonna take it right out and onto dry ice. And this will minimize your freezing artifacts. So what is a freezing artifact? Well. You want to freeze your tissue very quickly. You do not want to do it slow because the moment you do it slow, remember, tissue has water in it. Water content as soon as you take it out of your body. So if you're going to do it slow, you're going to get these huge ice crystals forming and degrade your tissue. It's basically ripping your tissue 
inside out. That's what you're doing to it. And the cells are going to burst because it's going too slow. So you want to do it very, very fast. And the most gentlest method is using isopentane in a liquid nitrogen bath. And that way you freeze it down quickly and it's nice and, and, and not too adverse. Like uh, if you did it in liquid nitrogen, as you know, if you drop something in liquid nitrogen, it just bubbles and cracks. You don't want that either. You want it nice and gentle, but not slow. So isopentane does that job. So if you use ethanol in dry ice, not good. It's not cold enough. So you need, you need the temperature of your freezing to be at least minus 80, if not lower. So that's what you would want. And like I said, these tissues are not fixed prior to going into your freezing. These are fresh, straight out of the animal and into your block for freezing. And that's how you're going to do your freezing. <laughs> and putting that into... It's really your call. To the microphone? Oh, sorry. The question was, is it better to freeze the tissue in OCT um, prior to the isopentane, or is it better to freeze the tissue straight up into isopentane? Or embed it? Yeah, yeah, embed it. Yeah, that'll be fine. So as soon as you guys take your tissue out or you have your tissue ready, put it into the actual cryo mold, put your OCT in, make sure there's no bubbles, and then make sure it's pressed down to the bottom of that mold and into the isopentane. directly in dry ice. Oh. So the question was, what if there's tissue that was frozen already that wasn't um, fixed in, was, um, sorry, in OCT and it was just fixed on dry ice, did you say? You can still do it. The only problem you might have is how was it fixed on dry ice? Because if it's too slow, you're going to get freezing artifact. Like, you just chuck it in five. So the cryo vial, okay. If it's onto the dry ice, it's gonna to be too slow. You might have freezing artifact. If it's into liquid nitrogen, that you actually took the tissue and just popped it into liquid nitrogen, it should be okay. And you still can mount that into OCT. Just make sure that it's not too abrupt of a temperature between coming from minus 80 into minus 20. You kind of want it to kind of come down to or come up to minus 20. Put your OCT in and then freeze it, which will be fine. And, or you can mount it directly onto a chuck if the tissue is big enough for you to cut onto um, with a cryost. So any questions on freezing? So now there's a special microtome that cuts this. Unfortunately, I have no pictures on that because it's very hard to come by. Um, but you'll see it here, at least part of it. So that part at the top, that's actually using a cryostat. And that cryostat is actually kept at minus 20 Minus 25, excuse me, it's a little dry. Let me grab some water. <laughs> um, right. So over there on the top, that's a cryostat. Now these do not cut in ribbons. They actually cut, um, they cut by the section. So one section at a time. And um, when you do it this way, these are actually easier to mount onto the Xenium than a ribbon because it's not in water. It's just flat right there on that part. You lift up, you lift up that little glass plate and the section the section's sitting flat there. And all you're gonna do is take your slide and mount it on. And you don't take that Xenium slide out of the minus 20, you keep it there. So as soon, if you, as soon as you mount your three sections, do not take it out, put it straight into a slide mailer with a desiccant, seal it, and put it straight into minus 80. So don't, don't let it come out at room temperature whatsoever. And with this technique as well, when you're using Xenium, once you take it out to minus 20 and let it uh, come up to minus 20 and you're using it and you open it, again, you only have about seven days to use it before um, it's not going to be of any use or it'll affect it. And then of course, once you mount it, I think it's four weeks, is it Farzani, that you can use, or one week? Four weeks. 
That's right. So it's four weeks. You can use it before analy analyzing it with parsing it or um, two weeks with FFP. So as you can see, it's the same thing. No overlapping, no crowding, and you don't want to touch the fiduciary areas of that file. Yeah. Um, Visium cytosis or Visium HD. Yeah. yeah, actually the process is a little bit easier because you're not dealing with the fiduciary areas and you wouldn't use more, you can't use two tissues or three tissues. So everybody has this misconception that you can mount multiple tissues so long as it fits within that lovely um, space for Visium, but in actuality, you can only, it's really, you're just good to use one because you, your area of interest is a little bit bigger, but it's only one tissue. So they're not gonna use like two separate areas to capture two separate sections, can't do it. It has to only be one section, but it's much easier on Visium HD or site assist. Yeah. It's going to be slightly complicated, but That's okay. when you're um, picking up the sample, so let's front plane about water bath for the GM slides, um, couldn't you potentially pick up some, some like um, RNA artifact from just being in the water? Yes, you can. So the question was, yeah, so the question, so the question was when we're picking up presenium on the water bath, so this is a FFPE technique, could we potentially be picking up any RNA or DNA from the actual water bath itself? You can, but that would mean that the, that your liquid salt that you're using is not um, RNA quality. So we usually use um, RNA free water. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and between each section, we have to clean the surface of the water. And when you clean with that, you have to use lint free water. You, I mean, lint-free tissue. You can't use regular Kleenex, paper towels. No, you have to use this lint-free um, lint cloth that we scrape across the water bath to pick up all the other debris so you don't pick it up with your other sections when you're mounting. And sometimes you will see a little bit of it if, if there's debris, but that's usually because they're not fixed well. So these all these micro debris that are lying around that you cannot see that you can potentially pick up. But most of the time that's avoided if you, you do the skim method with the tissue. So we use that. And then you clean all your, all your utensils you're going to use with RNA free, um, or sorry, DNAs away, if you want to call that, or RNAs away. We use that between each and every block, between each one. So it's always going to remain clean. Yep. Topic of the RNAs away. Mm -hmm. To also use that um, when we're trying to shoot in that, like for example, if we're dissecting out the brain of the mouse, we could also need to wipe out the RNAs. Like, okay, so the question was, um, are we going to be using uh, DNA or RNAs away when you're dissecting the tissue out of the animal or out of a patient? Well, out of a patient, we already know it should be. I hope so. Um, it would be wise to do that. Um, as well with your animal, especially if you know which tissue you're going to use, unless you don't know, but then I would just maybe in between the tissues. So let's say you're taking up the heart and the lung and I don't know, the kidney. So you don't want to get cross contamination between the two. So if you have RNAs away or DNAs away, by all means use it. Just make sure it's dry before you touch your tissue or you can use 70% um, would be a, another choice if you don't have it. No. Yeah, it's okay. You deal with um, like asymmetrical organ, like for example, the heart, when you're mounting it. Mm -hmm. Researcher wants a very particular sort of slice because it's kind of asymmetrical. And what if that has some sort of um, like morphological defect? Okay, so the question again for this one was what if they want to choose an area of the heart that you want to mount onto the slide? But it's a very specific area of that part. The section, right? Um, like how it's mounted is how you're going to section. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you're mounting tissues and you want a specific area, so just like that slide I had previously, where I had all these little red circles or squares, you're going to do the same with it. 
unless you're trying to reach a certain plane. So let's just say in the heart, you have the whole heart mounted, but you want to get the four chamber view. So now it all depends on how you cut your heart and orient it. Because if you cut it and you cut it down cross-sectionally, I'm never going to get that. You're only going to get the two, the two areas of the, of the heart, the two compartments. So when you cut it into four, you need to cut it down like um, I guess horizontally or laterally, longitudinally down the, the, down the heart. And it has to be at a certain plane because you need to get your anterior and your posterior part of, you need to orient your, your heart first to get your anterior and posterior, and then you're cutting at that plane. So what I usually ask researchers to do, let's say it is the heart that you're working with and you want that four chamber view, I will ask them exactly where do you need it? Because you can actually do that prior to you doing your tissue processing because fixation will also harden your tissue slightly and it'll be easy for me to actually take a blade and actually cut it down that midline so that you have a picture of your aorta, the atrium, and the ventricle, so you get all four. But if you're looking for, let's say, a cellular um, orientation or a cellular body that you injected into the heart, the only way you're going to be able to do that is you have to do an h &E. So you would do an h &E, you would circle that area, and when we mount that onto the Xenium slide, we would only mount that area. But most parts are very small, so we would be able to fit the whole entire heart on there at the kind of surface that you want. Uh, sorry, is there a fixed frozen option for Xenium, or is it not recommended? Uh, um, actually, actually, we'll be able to touch on that earlier. Uh, later, sorry. Um, it, it it is done. I just don't know what the outcomes are for it. It can be done where, so basically what she's asking, can you use a fixed piece of tissue and then fr freeze it? You can, there's two methods to it. I don't know which method Ashley was talking about, but if let's say you're using the brain, the most common one that I know of is they'll fix it in neutral buffered formalin or 4% PFA and then sucrose treat the tissue. Sucrose treating it is to replace the water content that's in the brain before freezing it. And it, that way you don't, you don't get that much distortion in the brain when you freeze it the way that we showed you up here. And then um, when you do it that way, it's easier to cut as well at thick sections of 10 microns. You'll get beautiful sections out of it. But again, I don't know what the impacts are downstream when, once you're, you're, you're testing for your senior. So oh, there have been a lot of amazing questions and I hate to cut them off, but unfortunately we're a little bit over time. I'm going to encourage anyone with any remaining questions, either put them in the Slack or if you're in, here in person, discuss over lunch. We are going to take a slightly shorter lunch than anticipated because we have one more short section to go through. Um, but afterwards, the food is here, so we'll be able to eat right away. Contact info is right there if you need it. Email, Skype or Slack.